heard. So welcome everyone. Um, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your afternoon coffee break. We're, we've reached panel four um, on our itinerary. So the impact of a Franco-Prussian war on military thought. Now, um, uh, for those who have just um, sort of logged in during the course of the day for the first time, um, it's a regret that I have to um, inform you that our first uh, plan speaker, Dr. Julian Asconjare, has um, couldn't make it this afternoon, and he's going to present a, a paper on Foch and the intellectual legacy of the Franco-Prussian War. So it'll be a kind of more of an Anglo-German bent to this <laughs> panel. But uh, David, I'll hand over to you at this point to introduce the speakers and to right. chair. Um, right. Michael, thank you very much. Um, I hope people can uh, see me. I've got a just so people know, I've got a slight issue with my iPad, but I hope the IT is, uh, is working all right. Uh, but uh, welcome to, to panel four. Um, uh, we've got a highly impressive uh, pair of presenters this afternoon, both uh, true experts um, uh, in their field. And as a consequence, we have an enlightening session um, in prospect. I'll, I propose to say just a few words by way of personal introduction. Uh, for each of uh, the presenters, and then hand over to Dr. Uh, Robert Foley um, to present his paper, and then uh, ask uh, Rob uh, Johnson, Dr. Rob Johnson, to deliver his. Subsequent to those presentations, we'll have the uh, the usual uh, Q and A. So, Dr. Robert Foley is a reader in defence studies at KCL and based at the Joint Services uh, Command Staff College. Um, he's an expert in. Uh, Wilhelmina German military thought and history, his German strategy and the path to Verdun, Erich von Falkenhayn and the development of attrition, uh, 1870 to 1916, published by Cambridge University Press in 2004, uh, was uh, notably awarded uh, the Royal Historical Society's uh, Gladstone Prize. He's also published um, Alfred von Schlieffen's Military Writings, published by Cass in 2004, and the Somme and Eyewitness History with H.B. McCartney, uh, published in the Folio Society in 2006. Uh, in addition to being the author uh, of numerous articles in international uh, uh, journals. And having been head of the Defence Studies Department and Dean of Academic Studies at the Joint Services Command and Staff College for the last five years, um, uh, Robert is now completing his, and I'm using his word, his long overdue uh, German army in the First World War, which will be part of Cambridge University Press's uh, armies uh, of the First World War uh, series. Well, uh, Rob uh, Johnson um, is director of the Changing Character of War Centre at Oxford University, and is also a senior research fellow at Pembroke, um, adjunct professor of the Norwegian Defence College Oslo and of the Rennes School in France. Uh, Rob has published uh, extensively on the 19th and 20th centuries military history with specific studies on the British armed forces. And amongst works relevant to this particular conference are technological determinism in the myths of war, chapters and articles on the Northwest frontier, the Anglo-Persian war, and an edited volume on the British Army. And his primary research interests are in strategy and the changing character of war. I'm going to take half a minute to um, embarrass uh, Rob because what's not mentioned uh, in that list is that Rob was a co-editor uh, with Professor uh, Jan Harland Matlari, uh, based in Oslo, of a major volume published recently by Hearst entitled Military Strategy in the 21st Century, The Challenge for NATO. It's a volume which is enjoying significant um, international uh, acclaim. So I think in terms of publications, we're, we're pretty much bang up to date. That's enough from me. You're not here to listen to me. You're here to listen to the two Robs. So if I should like very much to invite uh, Dr. Robert Foley to deliver his paper. Robert, over to you. Great, thank, thank you very much, David. Um, I, I 
Uh, hold on, am I? No, I'm, I guess I'm coming through. Um, thank you very much. I, I, I um, uh, appreciate those kind words um, as well. Um, and I'd, I'd like to uh, say thank you to everyone for the invitation to speak at this conference. Uh, I've really enjoyed the papers today and I've really enjoyed returning to an area of history I haven't explored in, in quite a long uh, while. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint, um, and I apologize for the, the kind of the e earphones that uh, I, I've got on. Um, but my uh, my daughter has returned um, from school, and and it's piano practice going on downstairs. So uh, so uh, I I, uh, I hope this might might kind of keep it a little bit a little bit uh, uh, a little bit um, sort of uh, in 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 train. Um, as some of the other speakers have done today, I'd like to express my debt of gratitude to Sir Michael Howard. Uh, not only did my research benefit greatly from his wisdom, uh, but the material on the Franco-German War amassed in the library of King's College London while he was there was invaluable uh, to my work uh, as well. Uh, it, it's really hard to overestimate the impact of the uh, Franco-German Wars on uh, 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 Franco-German War of 1870 and 71 on German military thought. Uh, this particular war cast a long shadow that shaped German military actions in the next Franco-German War beginning in 19, 1914. Of course, the results of 1870 and 1871 fundamentally shaped the new German Empire strategic situation, creating a near permanent animosity between France and Germany. Even as the Treaty of Frankfurt was being negotiated, German strategists looked forward to a future conflict between these two states. And as we heard this morning about Moltke's desire for a defeat of France once and for all, the military requirement for the annexation of Assas Lorraine, um, perhaps against uh, uh, Bismarck's better judgment, helped ensure that this future war would happen, uh, while at the same time it provided protection for this new empire. Thus, the war contributed to the topos of an inev inevitable war, as Wolfgang Mommsen termed it uh, some years ago, that pervaded German military thinking between 1871 and 1914. The war also provided the first and last, but certainly the most formative experience of combat for many commanders who would lead the German army in 1914. The nephew of the man hailed by Germany as the victor of the war in 1871, Helmut von Moltke, served as lieutenant in, a, in the Grenadier Regiment No. 7. Paul von Hindenburg took part in the Battle of Saint Privat as a lieutenant in the 3rd Guard Regiment Soufus, and later witnessed the Kaiser Proclamation in Versailles. Indeed, most, uh, many, if not most, of the non-royal senior leaders of the German army in the First World War uh, were junior officers in the wars of unification, and most never saw combat again before the outbreak of war in 1914. Johannes von Herringen, um, uh, Karl von Einem, Karl von Bülow, Alexander von Kluck, um, uh, August von Mackensen, as well as many others are, are good examples of this. Thus, the Franco-German War of 1870 and 71 played a key role in shaping their ideas about how wars could and should be conducted at the tactical level. The human cost of the battles of Mars the Tour, Gravelat, Saint Privat made a deep impression on these German soldiers, just as we heard in, um, or as we just heard in Mark Hewitson's paper. We also know that the war, and particularly battles like Saint Privat, spurred tactical innovation within the German army. In the years after the war, rivers of ink were spilled by German military theorists advocating competing tactical doctrines. Indeed, Jay Lovas quipped that one could spend years of one's life, the worst years in uh, Jay Lovas's view, working through this literature. <laughs> Many, if not most of these works based themselves on the events of 1870 and 1871. Perhaps my favorite example of this is the dueling Midsummer Night's Dream by Jakob Meckel and Winter Night's Reality uh, by, I believe, Albrecht von Boguslavsky, which argued for and against open and close order infantry tactics. This morning, Michael Rowe talked about the War of 1870 and 71 as a war of transition, connecting back to the Napoleonic Wars through Wilhelm I and Karl von Steinmetz, but it also certainly connected through to the First World War in both personnel and ideas. But what I'd like to do today, though, is to focus on three ways in which the experience of the Franco-German War of 1870 and 71 had the most impact, in my view, on German military thinking. These are three areas in which myths developed that hampered the German army's ability to analyze the events of 1870, and in particular, 1871. 
And we can also see the impact of these myths on the actions of the German army in 1914, and indeed throughout the First World War and perhaps beyond. These myths are concerned um, first with the significance and importance of the concept of decisive battle. Second, with the effectiveness of the German command structures and systems. And third, with the idea of the German army as a Volksheer or a people's army representing a folk in Waffen or a nation in arms, and that this had led to victory in 1871. I use the term myth here because I believe we can see the way in which these truths were deliberately simplified and distorted for other ends. The myths were created or at least fostered by the German army itself in the years after the Franco-German War in 1870 and 71. And these myths served important internal functions. They papered over some fundamental divisions and differences within the army and government and thereby preserving the illusion of unity, at least outwardly. However, while this may have succeeded in avoiding some challenging questions, the longer term impact of these myths was to freeze these differences in place and mean that the army and its government did not address some fundamental questions before the outbreak of war in 1914. Now, the first myth I'd like to look at is this idea of the significance and importance of the decisive battle or Entscheidungsschlacht. And this has been well covered by others, uh, Yehuda Wallach, for example, um, but it's important means that we need to really look at it here. And indeed, the concept of Entscheidungsschlacht was even challenged at the time by Hans Delbruck and some others, indicating that its significance was recognized by contemporaries as well. The battles of Metz and Sedan were rightly celebrated as great victories over the army of the French Empire um, in the years after 1871. However, this celebration, together with the celebration of battles like Königgrätz, developed in time into a myth of the decisiveness of battles. The lesson, if you will, taken from was, this was that the battlefield action could and would lead to meaningful political effects, even if, in reality, Metz and Sedan did not win the Franco-German War. In other words, a future war would be decided by a handful of large battles. Moltke himself wrote in his instructions for higher commanders, first published in 1868 and revised in 1885 and again in 1910, quote, the goal in war can never be more completely reached than through combat and its main objective only through the destruction of the enemy's main strength in the open field, therefore through battle, unquote. Now what this meant was that the army struggled to move beyond a tactical approach to warfare, even when it was clear from experience that this would not be sufficient. Strategy followed and was shaped by tactical actions rather than providing the lead. And again and again, German military theorists and strategists returned to the idea of battle as a decisive component of any future war. We can see this very clearly in the writings and plannings of Alfred von Schlieffen, for example. And this concept was at the heart of all German war plans between 1871 and 1914. It also helped foster the short war belief that dictated German strategic decision-making in 1914. Now, I'm well aware, of course, of the research of Stickforster and Annika Mombauer and others um, that indicate a growing recognition of the problems of short war under modern conditions. But despite the clear cognitive dissonance of the two Moltkes, neither did much to challenge the fundamentals of the war plan constructed around the principle of decisive battle. And the core of the so-called Schlieffen plan of 1914 was the rapid destruction of the French army. Another implication of this focus on the, defense, on the decisive battle was that the German army placed all its efforts in training and preparation for such actions. The literature I referred to earlier was largely focused on how to fight these decisive battles more effectively. The army largely ignored, with some notable exceptions, and we can go into this perhaps in, in, in questions, at the second half of the Franco-German War. Hence, it was unprepared for the Kleine Krieg, or the Partisan War, that arose in Belgium in 1914. And this, I think, goes a long way to help us understand some of the German actions in, in, in Belgium and northern France in 1914. And it was also completely unprepared for the long attritional struggle that was the First World War. And it itself, it struggled to develop a new approach to this conflict. Now, of course, the German army was not alone in its emphasis on the importance of battle, but its experience of the second phase of the Franco-German War presented a missed opportunity to learn about the character of a people's war, an opportunity that, that, that some German uh, authors in the interwar period um, uh, highlighted, but wasn't picked up by the army uh, as a whole. 
Now, the second myth I'd like to look at is the effectiveness of German approaches to command. And there are two elements in my view to this. Uh, the first is command within the army, and there's a second command of the army. Uh, and looking at the idea of command in the army to start with. Um, now, this is what I'm talking about here is what we'd later refer to as the idea of Auftragstaktik um, or Führung nach Direktiv or Weisungsführung, um, some of the other kind of terms that were, were used to describe this. Uh, not officially uh, at, at the time, um, but but I think capture some of these ideas and, and some of our, what I want to, to uh, get after here too. Now, we've heard today uh, how the war had demonstrated some serious problems of command at the highest levels within the army. Uh, in the initial stages of the war, um, Karl von Steinmetz, the commander of the First Army, uh, disobeyed uh, Moltke's orders and advanced on the French at, at Spickeren on the 6th of uh, August of 1870, and was only saved from disaster by the quick thinking of the Prussian Prince, uh, Prussian Prince Karl's, uh, Friedrich Karl's Second Army. Now, I think this, as well as other actions like this, reinforced in Moltke's mind the idea that no plan survives contact with the enemy or indeed one's own army. Moltke later wrote of Steinmetz in the Enspekeren, quote, the battle had certainly not been anticipated, but generally speaking, a tactical victory rarely fails to coincide with a strategic policy. Uh, success in battle is, uh, has always been thankfully accepted, unquote. This approach to command, I think, had important implications for German war planning. German war plans, um, despite being more complex and detailed by 1914, were really deployment plans or Aufmarschpläne. The Aufmarschplan only sketched out initial deployments and initial engagements. How a campaign would unfold would in part be determined by events and by the actions of the enemies in one's own armies. So Moltke is trying to embrace the, 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 um, uh, uh, the good elements of, of, uh, of, of what he saw as an inevitable part of war, that you couldn't plan too far ahead, and that therefore you just had to kind of trust your, your, your forces and your, your army uh, uh, as, as much as you could. And we can see this at work as late as March 1918, when Ludendorff brushed aside calls for operational objectives um, uh, and, and, and said that really what he wanted to do was, was kick in the door and then, and then see what would happen. Further, with no real exploration of the disobedience of Steinmetz uh, and, 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 and others, uh, the German army was never able to um, uh, uh, to, to explore some of the, the challenges that arise from these, these, uh, th this particular approach to, to, to command um, and some of the challenges of how you conduct modern operations um, in even more complex armies uh, later in, the, in, the, 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 uh, in, in this time period as well. It also meant, of course, that, that there was no exploration of that different levels of command. Um, and there's no level of command above army in the German army in 19, 1914, uh, despite the fact that, that, that um, it, it could have benefited from the idea of an army group. And this may have come out from a further exploration of command within the German, the German army uh, in particularly the second phase of the Franco-German uh, Franco War. Um, now, the second element of command relates really to the idea of high command. Um, now, we heard earlier uh, about the structure of the higher command in the Franco-German War, this triangle of, of command that, that developed with um, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm, uh, or, or sorry, uh, Wilhelm I uh, at, at, at the top, balancing the kind of competing ideas of Bismarck and, 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 and Moltke. And in some ways, the Franco-German War represents the high point of the development of this style of, of, of command, with, where Wilhelm acts as commander in chief, um, both of the national government, as we've heard, uh, but also of the army uh, a, a, as well. Um, and Wilhelm was responsible for balancing this advice from these key advisors, um, particularly Moltke and, and Bismarck, but also Rune as well, and making all major political and, and military decisions. But we've heard about some of the disagreements between Bismarck uh, and, and Moltke over the prosecution of, of the war. And we can see this most um, clearly in the prosecution of the second phase of the war and the decision to bombard Paris, for e e example. And these frictions may have been fairly open secrets within the German army and, and the government after the war, but they were largely swept under the rug. Uh, 
and do not seem to have led to any serious discussion about how an approach to command in any, in any future conflict. Indeed, Moltke the Elder himself explicitly denounced the concept of a Kriegsrat or a council of war as a means of exercising, exercising command. Um, and he pointed uh, in, in his sort of, uh, in, a, in an appendix in it to uh, his history of the Franco-Prussian War um, to the role in which the Kaiser played this, this uh, the, the role that the Kaiser, the role that Wilhelm I played in, in making these, these decisions and how these decisions were his alone rather than, rather than any, anybody else's. Um, and I think this is important because what he's doing here is he's reaffirming the issue of commando gewalt or power of command of the, of the king and emperor. Um, and he's reaffirming this structure, this, this, tri this troika of, uh, of, of commanders um, that, in his view, was still a, an effective means of, of, uh, of commanding um, within war. And he wrote this appendix to his, his, uh, his, his, uh, his history of the war, I believe, and it's in about 1885, uh, perhaps even a little bit later. So even fairly late in, 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 in a time frame, he still sees this as an effective means of, of, of command. Um, and I think from this, we get that, that Moltke and the army never examined how to establish a structure of high command that was independent, or perhaps better, less said, uh, less dependent, or perhaps better said, less dependent on personality. And indeed, this power uh, of the myth of high command was strong. In 1906, uh, Wilhelm II appointed Helmut von Moltke the Younger as his chief of the general staff, in part because of the symmetry with his grandfather in 1870. And if there had been a Bismarck or a Rune available, I've no doubt that Wilhelm II would likely have appointed them as well. But more seriously, below the surface, we can see a strong current within the army aimed at keeping civilians out of military decision making. Again, a kind of product, I think, of the, of the uh, particularly the second phase of the Franco-German War. And we can see how the Frank, and we can see this, and how the Prussian Minister of War was progressively sidelined throughout the history of of uh, of, of Wilhelm in Germany. And we could also see this in how the chief of the general staff became more secretive about war plans over time. We've got fairly little evidence about Moltke the Elder's relationship with Bismarck after 1871, but he seems unlikely to have shared details of his future war plans. And certainly his successors, Waldese and Schlieffen, and to a lesser extent Moltke the Younger, did not keep Bismarck's successors well informed about their own war plans. In part, this may have been an example of a power struggle within the army and the general staff's desire to expand its influence at the expense of the other army institutions, but it meant that the German army went to war in 1914 with various elements of its national power unable to cooperate effectively. Now, the third myth I'd like to look at is that the German army had effectively harnessed the power of a people in arms. Now, there were very good uh, domestic political reasons for portraying the victory of, uh, over the French as a victory brought about by the people of Germany. Indeed, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels famously wrote that the German, uh, quote, unity had been found in the barracks, unquote. Uh, and mobilization of German and later French troops was impressive and seriously outstripped previous wars um, during the Franco-German War. We should not forget, however, that the victories of the wars of unification represent a victory of the conservative view of Wilhelm I and Rhun about army organization um, over those supporting a landwehr or a more militia approach to defense. The wartime victories, particularly over France, proved the effectiveness of short-term conscription backed by various classes of reserves and soon became the model across the rest of, rest of Europe. Despite the popular view as the German army as being a Volkswehr, however, it never came close to this. The army, or perhaps better said armies of the Second German Empire, re remained armies of their ruler, swearing, swearing to follow the orders of the Oberste Kriegsherr, the supreme commander, and swearing an oath of allegiance to their contingents herr, um, the head of their, the contingent element of their, their, their army. Uh, moreover, the German Empire was never able to make effective use of its growing manpower. The size of the German population grew to more than 65 million uh, in 1911, from 41 million in 1871. However, the German military only conscripted about 40% of those eligible every year, and the rest received little or no military training. In August 1914, there were almost 10.5 million men liable and able for conscription. However, of these, some 5.5 million had not received any military training at all, 
The German army mobilized about 3.8 million men in August 1914, or about 36.5% of the available cohort. Now this compares to about 85% of the French manpower who were conscripted in the same period. The general staff had uh, desired expansion of the army for a considerable time, but was, this was generally blocked by the Ministry of the War. And again, this is in part because the general staff is focused on external enemies and a desire to win decisive battlefield victories. The Ministry of War, however, was focused more on internal enemies and the reliability of the army. In other words, maintaining the ar army as contingent era rather than creating a Volkswehr. Relations between the general staff and the Minister of, Ministry of War were so bad by 1914 that the general staff did not even inform the Ministry of War about the creations of six ersatz divisions um, in, in uh, August 1914. And the Ministry of War only found out about these when, uh, from the military cabinet when the officers were assigned to this. And this brings us back to the pernicious influence of the myth of command. Even in 1914, limited cooperation between the two most important institutions within the German army uh, are a result of this, uh, of this divisions of command. Of course, this probably wouldn't have mattered if the myth of decisive battle had been a reality and the war had been concluded quickly. So I mentioned as well that there are some enduring kind of strengths of these, these myths. Um, these myths shaped German decisions and actions, not only in 1914, but throughout the, the First World War. Um, and, uh, and indeed, we, we can sort of explore some of that, and, and we've mentioned some of that earlier today as well. And through these myths, we can see the shadow of 1870 and 71 in 1914 to 1918. So first, this idea of decisive battle. Um, the heart of the great German, uh, this was at the heart of the great German um, Strategiestreit in the First World War. Falkenhayn recognizing, uh, recognized battle itself was no longer decisive politically, while well, Hindenburg and Ludendorff held to an older concept. Hindenburg later wrote of how he expected the war to be won by one or more Saddam-like battles. Ludendorff's offensives in 1918 were also purely military affairs aimed, aimed at a battlefield solution to Germany's strategic problem. Decisive battle also meant that the Imperial German army never carried through its conceptual development to enable effective linking of tactical action with strategic effect. Falkenhayn tried to do this at Verdun, but his concepts were muddled and not understood by his subordinates. Because he remained a student of decisive battle, Ludendorff embraced Moltke's approach of having tactical events dictate or at least guide strategy. On more than one occasion, he lamented what he saw as too much focus on operations and or strategy. In command, German command at the higher, higher levels was a mess in the First World War, in large part because of the questions of command never raised during the Franco-German War. Um, uh, the questions of command raised during the Franco-German War had never really been addressed. Until 1918, there remained deep divisions within the various institutions within the army uh, that made its effective uh, and efficient running difficult, especially between the general staff and the Ministry of War. Moreover, in 1914, the lack of an army group level of command designed to execute various lines of operation of the German war plan created problems in controlling the various armies of the Western Front and contributed to the defeat of the Battle of the Marne. Most significant, of course, the German command in the First World War was the inability of the various elements of the government to work together effectively. This began during the initial campaigns of 1914 and ran through the entire war, culminating perhaps with the silent dictatorship of Hindenburg and Ludendorff. Finally, this idea of nation and arms. The lack of manpower and units in 1914 meant that the German army went to war with well, without what the general staff wanted for its operations and was deficient at a time that might have made a real difference. Now, of course, this, uh, these, these events cannot be laid completely at the door of the myths create, uh, arising from the Franco-German War of 1870 and 71, but the problems created by, by these myths um, certainly meant that the German army was not as well prepared as it might have been um, to fight its war in 1914 uh, and, uh, and, and throughout the war in 1918 as well. Thank you very much. Great. Robert, thank you very much. <clears throat> I think I hope I've actually sorted out my, uh, my IT problem. I hope people now can, uh, can hear me. Um, I won't comment at this stage. Um, I will pass over to, uh, to Rob Johnson. And then uh, after Rob has concluded his remarks, um, just by way of kicking off Q&A, uh, 
uh, make uh, one or two comments. So without further ado, if I could uh, ask Rob uh, to begin his presentation, that will be smashing. Well, thank you very much indeed, David. And do let me know if you can hear me clearly. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, well, let me uh, first of all thank you, know, Michael, Mark, Danny, Joe, uh, King's College London in particular, um, for, uh, running this event. I think it's a very, very um, good event, and it's great that we're doing it right now. Um, I'd also just like to thank the chair for his generous remarks at the very beginning. Of course, he is an author of the book he mentioned about military strategy in the 21st century. So um, thank you very much indeed, David. Um, there is a paper uh, that, uh, that I have uh, produced. Um, if anyone would like to uh, help me by reviewing uh, the paper, I would be very grateful. I think the whole purpose of academic events like this is to help us really uh, you know, kind of assist in raising the quality uh, of what it is we, we're trying to produce. Um, let me begin, though, with a generic question that I think affects uh, all of the, uh, the papers we've heard, and indeed the work we do when we look at conflicts like the Franco-German War. Um, and the first question is this, what, what do nations or armed forces learn from the experience of others? Uh, we just heard Rob talking very expertly about what the Germans learned about their own experience. What it is that they learn from others and, and what do they adopt? Uh, and what do they adapt and why do they choose those particular elements? It's an interesting question for us to consider. Um, first thing to say about this war, the British, is that it revealed, or, or perhaps the better word is reminded uh, the British, of the need for ur urgent modernization and investment uh, in their land forces. But bottom line up front here, the, it, this conflict was less influential than the Crimea, uh, the Crimean War uh, of the 1850s, or indeed the South African War, um, you know, subsequently uh, in 1899, 1902. And it's for the simple reason that um, the defense of the United Kingdom rested on the Royal Navy, uh, not on the army. Uh, the defeat of France made actually very little difference to uh, the Royal Navy's strength, or indeed, therefore, uh, by extension, the strength of the United Kingdom. Um, the really important lesson for the British was that, uh, for the, at the time for the British, was that the British did not need any continental land commitment for its national defence. It was a maritime power. And perhaps this was uh, the era of 1914. Um, perhaps they, they've never seen this, obviously, but that's something that we'll uh, pick up and discuss later. Now, most of the scholarship uh, on what the British Army learned from the Franco-German War has dwelt on the liberal reforms of Sir Edward Cardwell and his successors. But as John Gooch uh, has stated uh, some years ago now, that it was coincidental, uh, the occasion of this war, with the reforms that took place in Britain. The reforms, in other words, were already underway. The Crimea, uh, John Gooch points out, was far more influential. And we have to say, when we look at the uh, actual evidence of the British Army after 1871, uh, it was not uh, on the French or Prussian model. Uh, it was largely consisted of garrisons around its empire with flying columns for colonial operations. When you look at their performance, field craft, uh, skillet arms were very poor, staff work remained bad, uh, there were inadequate scales of equipment and ammunition. Uh, there was little uh, modern artillery, machine guns until much later. And the mobilization scheme that Britain put together in 1875 was abandoned uh, in the early 1880s. There was no conscription and there were far too reserves uh, because Britain relied on an all volunteer force. And the changes that did take place, largely the lessons, like the battlefield lessons, largely came from colonial wars but of course were usually inappropriate for war against a near peer uh, adversary. Now, if we had longer, we could talk a little bit about British views of the war generally. Um, when the war broke out, uh, generally in favor of the Prussians, um, there were lots of old suspicions about Napoleon III and his adventurism of the 1860s, which we heard about earlier. Um, the British though expected a long war. Um, Benjamin Disraeli in the House of Commons uh, made this particular point. Uh, and, um, there was great concern, uh, I'm sure many of you know, that France might invade Belgium 
uh, which would necessitate uh, British military intervention, or at least armed neutrality of some sort. The fall of Paris, to some extent, changed British public opinion. Um, there was pretty wild speculation uh, that Germany uh, might invade Britain, um, which was, of course, captured most famously by Colonel George Chesney's uh, Battle of Dorking, uh, which was serialized by Blackwoods. Um, the whole thing was predicated on uh, the threat posed by the new engines of war, uh, particularly torpedoes and mines, uh, against the Royal Navy. The destruction of the Royal Navy would leave Britain open to invasion. Again, emphasis here was maritime, not land forces as such. Um, what about the army, the, the military uh, observations? Of the war? Well, first of all, um, not surprisingly, uh, they made observations about frontal assaults being extremely costly, as we've heard about uh, Gravelot saint um, One of the uh, aging uh, docu you know, documents I have in my own possession here is um, the Honourable uh, Alison Wynne's book, uh, What I Saw of the War, um, which was published actually in 1870, uh, and uh, the copy I have is the 1871 um, edition. Another observation on the war itself, um, there's a lot of British military uh, discussion about Moltke having crossed the Moselle uh, prematurely. Um, there's a lot of discussion about the advance of Paris, whether uh, actually the British, uh, whether the German forces should have invested the city uh, or, uh, or not, um, much debated. However, um, there were observations and lessons for the army after the war, which I think uh, have much greater Wait. Um, first of all, the Prussianization of drill books. Um, uh, many of you are familiar with, with this, uh, which is uh, Walls's um, Soldier's Pocket Book uh, for Field Service. Um, clearly, references in here to um, musketry, uh, importance of skill of arms, the use of loose skirmish formations, the swarm assaults by infantry, um, have often been attributed to Walls's observations about the Franco German War. The fact of the matter is, though, these tactics were already in use uh, in um, the northwest frontier of India, for example. The army in India was already using all these uh, particular types of tactics. Others talk about weaponry. Uh, the Martini Henry rifle was introduced, a breech loader, of course, in 1871. Um, but of course, this only replaced uh, the first breech loader, the Snyder. So again, the reforms in terms of breech loading weaponry were already underway. What about theories of war? Well, there were some translations of French and German work um, after the war was over, um, but the British uh, military um, preferred um, military history as opposed to anything that might be theorised about war. Theories were seen as unhelpful by the Continental, uh, and what the British um, preferred was their sort of military pragmatism. There were lots of um, observations about morale. Uh, but again, the British Army already emphasised um, control, discipline as its primary uh, characteristic, at least that's the way they saw themselves. Um, and in the, the Franco-German War, what they saw was an endorsement of this particular ethos. It's what they had expected. And they expected their own soldiers to exhibit spirited uh, you know, morale intact uh, and doggedness um, in defence. Of the uh, defeat of France, uh, the British military observed um, that this had led to revolution and civil, or as they put it, moral collapse. Uh, regular troops forced into bitter street fighting. And here there were echoes to the British, uh, again, uh, of older events, the Indian mutiny, um, unrest in Ireland. Uh, that was what was being commented on, and that the, um, rather than the, the, the US of France. Then there's logistics, um, the logistical tail of both um, the French and the German armies uh, got larger, more complicated, needing more efficient staff work. The British had learnt this lesson the hard way themselves uh, during the Crimean War, as well, famously. The Royal Navy had kept the army supplied and therefore mobile. The consequence of that was the staff work remained pretty ad hoc uh, for the British Army. Some things were, of course, introduced. The telegraph system was being introduced in the Crimean War, um, and that meant more political direction, or as well as the British military put it, as uh, interference. Uh, final couple of things in terms of observations on the war itself, offensive action. There was a great deal of praise in British military writing, Waltke's offensive and concentric operations. 
this was already a trait, again, in colonial campaigning, went on being in forces where relatively small forces were faced with much larger territories and larger uh, numbers of adversaries. Being on the attack uh, was seen as the most pragmatic and sensible way of uh, asserting sort of moral effect on one's opponents. Uh, the British made uh, references to the animating value of the arme blanche, uh, which could be attributed to the Franco-German War, but again, I think is already in existence. Uh, I won't dwell on the other continuities uh, in the interest of time. Let's just say something though about this idea that the Crimea uh, had created many more lessons for the British. Um, the British were not planning on a continental war, uh, so I think uh, that the lessons of the Franco-German War were rather limited. Britain was a naval power, as I say, with the emphasis on free trade and diplomacy to reduce the likelihood of war in the first place. Uh, if there was going to be war, Britain would form coalitions. It wouldn't fight on its own, as France had done. Um, it would limit a major war to the continent by its sea control. Uh, if it did uh, emit an expeditionary army to the peripheries of the continent, it would do so only in coalition with local allies, and it would only be possible with naval supremacy, bringing them back to the same argument about maritime uh, uh, focus. If there was to be a war, Britain would engage in a blockade by the Royal Navy. Uh, and uh, while uh, Europeans were rather focused on Napoleonic style battles, as Rob has just been telling us, Britain uh, had a much limited view about battles. They, they rather felt that the idea was to constrain and erode uh, any uh, adversary on the continent by protraction and by coalition, not by engaging in a decisive battle necessarily. Crimean war lessons uh, on land have been about making sure you had technological superiority uh, through, for example, um, the uh, percussion rifle and mini ammunition, um, and a great deal of all, all emphasis on logistics and services. He would require technological uh, you know, uh, support too. Um, in terms of manpower, um, we know that the volunteer services, you know, the volunteer movements um, were there to augment the militia and yeomanry for home defence. But they emerged in 1852, um, you know, long before this particular conflict. And, and frankly, observations of the Garde Mobile um, were pretty critical. They, they felt that they were uh, poor relations to the regulars. The, the central focus of the literature, as I said at the beginning, has been uh, on the Cardwell reforms. I don't want to do a retread of this very well aspect of British military um, scholarship. Uh, the Enlistment Act of 1870, the Localization Act of 1873, Introduction to 12 Years Service, uh, Six Years in the Regulars, the Sixth Reserve, um, seemed to be an emulation of the Prussian model. But, but let's look at this because ultimately the card war reforms failed. The British army remained undermanned uh, throughout the later 19th century. In Egypt, for example, the Egyptian campaign of 1882, um, Britain needed to call out 10,000 reserves just to bring the battalions up to time strength. And issues like the abolition of purchase, had, that system had already been discredited and was out of fashion before the Crimean War. Uh, the compensation uh, scheme, by the way, cost the taxpayers seven million pounds. Uh, so uh, this was conceived as a political disaster uh, rather than a success story. There was no general staff because of the fears of the elite. Um, and we have to say when it even comes to the War Office Act, um, of 1870, better barracks, um, you know, uh, canteens, food, uh, the abolition of flogging. Again, all of these were Crimean legacies rather than the legacies of observations of the Franco-German War. Again, if I had more time, I'd love to uh, articulate a little bit more about colonial wars and their influence on uh, the shaping of the British uh, military thinking rather than the Franco-German War. But I've already mentioned offensive action, um, could talk a little bit about the use of artillery, always forward, always close. Uh, was that a German influence? Uh, not really. Uh, it was really to do with the means to have contained forces when you don't have uh, forces strung out in line of march, you become vulnerable to attack by ambush. Um, even things like field craft or the adoption of khaki, uh, these were uh, colonial um, observations. They weren't things that came from uh, the war in Europe. Um, Sir Garnet Wolsey uh, was clearly very, very influential um, in trying to modernize uh, the army. He did make uh, observations clearly about um, the Franco-German War. Uh, and um, I have to say that in many ways, those reforms were rather ineffective. 
Just taking one example, there were only 32 officers past staff college every year, far too few uh, to actually man the sort of headquarters that would be common to a German uh, army's headquarters in the late 80s and 90s. Um, if we look at the uh, uh, other areas, you know, again, uh, I'd like to talk to you about the 1885 war scare with France, issues like the Eastern crises of the affair. Fundamental thing here is that the Royal Navy gave the British confidence to deal with continental crises like this. Um, uh, you know, uh, Lord Salisbury uh, famously described the British, he said, we are fish. Uh, we're not going to engage in these continental uh, kind of wars. The Royal Navy could exercise influence globally. It could protect commerce. That was the priority. The public and the British government successively were not interested in trying to influence European affairs when their interests were so global. Uh, other than through uh, diplomatic means. Britain, as a result, was very slow, perhaps, to recognise the tendencies uh, that were going on within the French and German armies. There was professional interest uh, in the late 19th century, but really uh, they weren't really adopting um, the observations that they made. The scale of the British army remained very, very small. Uh, it only got bigger because of the Russian landward threats to India, not because of what they were seeing uh, in the Franco-German War. And by the way, I should just mention here David French's work um, showing that the British Army was not as small so often it's pointed out to be uh, by others. Um, after the Crimea, uh, the army, if you include uh, the Indian Army, the army in India, numbered 468,000, uh, which compares to the French numbers of about 470,000, the Russian 200,000, or Austria's 350,000. Uh, so, you know, we need to put these things back in context. The difference is. The British army was dispersed, 26,000 uh, British soldiers in India, 50,000 uh, in the Dominion and elsewhere, the rest in the colonies. So hugely dispersed and therefore didn't appear to be uh, uh, on the French or, or German model. There were, of course, further reforms in the 1880s, uh, commissions and inquiry by Derby, by Hartington, which found that Britain was underspending uh, on its armed forces. There was no unified command system. Uh, there was no unified or single intelligence service, no long-term planning, but the, the British government rejected all the recommendations of those uh, reforms, those inquiries. There were advocates for change who observed the war, like Sir Charles Dilt, H.O. Uh, Arnold Foster, Lord Wolsey himself, but still no fundamental reform. And in 1895, uh, Lord Lansdowne uh, attempted uh, minor changes to the armed forces, um, particularly the British Army to increase the army's size, to, to improve its terms and conditions of service. But ultimately, he was keen to keep costs down and therefore his action to was very, very limited indeed. So the real changes uh, were a, a result of um, the South African War, where Britain's army's uh, deficiencies were exposed brutally in places of events like Black Week in 1899. Staff work was very poor. Uh, the artillery was in short supply. Fieldcraft failed. Uh, there was a continued emphasis on cavalry because of the great distances of uh, the Transvaal and Cape. Um, and offensive operations, uh, you know, seemed to have won uh, for the British Army, but they were far too small. They needed 450,000 men uh, to deal with just 70,000 Afrikaner fighters. 90% of the reserve had been pulled out, exceeding all the planning assumptions of, of the 1890s. So let me conclude. Um, British Army. Uh, did not derive significant lessons from the Franco-German War. And those observations it did make, uh, it didn't apply them, despite the efforts of men like Sagan and Wolsey. Why was this? Ultimately, liberal governments opposed large army, uh, a large army and uh, large expenditures uh, on the army. Conservative governments too wanted to reduce spending on the whole. Um, and both conservative and liberal governments uh, regarded that the primary defence of the United Kingdom was through diplomacy, first of all, then through commerce to foster peace, and thirdly through the Royal Navy to control, control the oceans and the approaches to the United Kingdom. Then next on the list would be prosperity. Uh, that was put above a large standing force. So ultimately, the Crimean War was much more influential in making changes to the army and its thinking, but both produced that, that war and indeed the South African War later to some extent produced inadequate levels of change. When Britain went to war in 1914, it did so with a munitions industry that was too small uh, and with manning that was far too small. And therefore, given that the 
the army they had in 1914, it remains the legacy of, of that Franco-German war for the British, that it was absurd for the British to commit to a continental land war in Europe with the forces it actually possessed. It was Henry Wilson's tragic mistake. The irony, of course, of that BEF deployment was it was precisely because of French military weakness in the Franco-German War that led to the British expeditionary force being sent at all. The British Army's problem, therefore, was not its size, but its use. It was the wrong force task that it was given. And perhaps that remains the, the lasting uh, legacy of that conflict with the British. And as a personal note, I just wanted to point out my other props I have here. Um, Cassell's um, volumes, two volumes of the Franco-German Wars, Franco-German War, not the Russian, Franco Russian War, produced in 1872, uh, was indeed the first uh, book uh, that I read uh, as a young man, uh, other than children's books, um, and the first book I read at university was Michael Howard's Franco-Russian War. Thank you very much. Uh, Rob, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, Rob times two, uh, if I can uh, use that phrase. If I might make a couple of uh, comments, uh, first relating to, to Robert, uh, uh, Robert Foley's uh, presentation and then to, uh, to Rob Johnson's. And we've got a number of questions, so I shan't tarry. They'll be more important to get round to those questions. But uh, thank you, Robert, for a very persuasive treatment uh, of myths and bringing out uh, their essential quality, which is uh, that of being pernicious, um, I think, um, across uh, the whole uh, compass of those topics which you addressed, and uh, pernicious because uh, they promoted a crucial distortion which uh, brought with it a uh, significant penalty. Um, and as somebody who has a particular interest in strategy and strategic leadership, your comments there about the Entscheidungsflucht, or decisive battle, and that a consequence of that was the, uh, the effect of placing primacy on the operational approach uh, at the expense of the strategic, I think uh, was, um, I have to say, uh, notable. Um, a final comment I would make at this point, and it will be linked to a question that Sir Hugh Strawn has placed, but we'll come on to the question if we may in a little while, was that the elements of national power were not cohesive. Uh, and uh, and the, uh, the First World War began with, with such uh, significant uh, penalty, and there'll be a bit of elaboration on that with Sir Hugh's um, uh, question. The, um, Rob really struck there, important comment, I think, about the uh, colonial uh, conflicts, and there is a link here um, to the comments made by Olivier uh, in panel one this morning, um, when he talked about the challenge for France being to bridge the experience of colonial and expeditionary engagement to conducting high intensity combat um, as represented by the, uh, you know, the Franco-Prussian uh, uh, war. Um, and interestingly, I've had the benefit, I have to say to colleagues attending this, to have read Rob's um, excellent accompanying paper and having studied it. So there are a couple of things I might mention which are in that paper. And a point you make, I think, uh, of fundamental importance, uh, Rob, is um, uh, when you say the conclusion we must draw from this period is that the British Army's record of colonial uh, engagement bestowed experience on its personnel, but did not expose them to the realities of modern warfare against a peer uh, state. And so the observation you made also about a concentration on uh, maritime power and the projection of maritime power, which meant it would be possible to avoid commitment to a European uh, land war. Um, the, I think a very resonant concluding observation you make is, the fault in learning was therefore not a military one, rather it was a political or strategic one. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and I think you also mention uh, in connection with that, therefore the uh, a, a comment of uh, Woolsey's that uh, any British misfortunes in colonial wars or military engagements had occurred from a close literal adhesion on the part of the colonels and generals to the dry as dust rules taught in every work as military science. And I think, uh, and linked to that, you refer to successive foreign secretaries made much 
of needing to judge each crisis on its merits, rather than trying to determine iron laws in British policy. And very briefly, I think what I distill from that is the importance of recognizing the essential quality of an adaptive approach when it comes to strategy. And central to that approach has to be dynamic, non-prejudiced learning. That's enough from me. And if I can now move to Q&A and, and if people will, colleagues will forgive me, since I did mention uh, Hugh uh, uh, having made a comment relating to an observation I made. Uh, Hugh, um, the question you uh, put about uh, Prussian ministers of war uh, being uh, generals, would you like to, uh, to present that question? If not, I'm happy to read it out. Uh, I don't know whether Hugh has picked up on that. Okay, if he, if he does come in, fine. Otherwise, I'll pose it. Uh, and you, you direct this uh, to Rob, Rob Foley, I should say. Given the Prussian ministers of war were themselves generals, von Einem included, why were tensions so great between the ministry and the general staff? Is the requirement to keep the army politically reliable sufficient? It's a good question. Um, I, I, I don't think it's the only reason, but I, I think it's an important reason. Um, and, I, and I think there's a whole host of different reasons that, that some of which I, I touched a little bit upon. upon. I, I think there, there's great competition within the army, um, within the different institutions within the army, and there's a rivalry between the general staff and the, and the Ministry of War um, that I think leads to tensions and frictions there to begin with. Um, I mean, Gordon Craig has kind of famously uh, pointed out the, the sort of the sidelining of the Prussian ministers of war, in part because they had to answer questions in the Reichstag. Um, and the less they, less they knew, the better. Um, I think is, is one kind of area to things. Um, I think they're also, the Ministry of War is also concerned about cost. Um, I think Rob's point about the uh, Navy is an important one. Um, what I haven't talked about is the rise of the German Navy uh, during this, 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 this period too. Navies are expensive um, and uh, it, it's hard to have a large Navy and a large army. Um, and I think ultimately this helps to um, uh, stop the kind of general staff's view, you know, push for kind of an expansion of the army uh, in its tracks because it, it's going to cost a lot of money and it's going to cost a lot of political capital to, uh, to change the, uh, uh, to bring the Reichstag around to supporting uh, army expansion as well. I think there's very little, little political will within, um, within the German government uh, represented in part by the Prussian Minister of War um, to kind of uh, uh, enable that. And, and, and have that come out. Uh, I, I also think you know we could look at personnel um, to a certain extent. Um, you know the, the extent to which the uh, Ministry of War is staffed by the people who didn't make it in the in the uh, general staff. Um, I, I'd have to go in a little bit deeper into it, but uh, uh, I, I think you know although they had general staff training, most of these officers were never picked up as general staff officers. So that may have played a a, a role in some of these these tensions there as well. Hope that answers answers the question. Great, thank you very much. Um, yeah, sorry. Okay, well, we've got um, uh, uh, a number of questions uh, from uh, uh, Jay Phillips. Um, uh, first one refer referring to the unexpected finality of uh, Königsgratz and Zidane, and then going on to a question relating specifically to the uh, to the general staff. Uh, would you like to um, uh, to put those questions? Um, I think both were uh, look as though they're being directed to uh, 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 to, to Robert Foley. Uh, they have indeed. Thank you very much. Um, the finality of Königgratz and 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 Sudan, I think, has um, to some extent misled historians to reading backwards into the thinking of Moltke that this was the intended outcome, whereas um, uh, I believe it to be apparent that Moltke. Um, knowing that uh, no plan would survive the first contact with the enemy, simply put the um, uh, machinery and the troops in place uh, in order to um, uh, give the commanders the ability 
to win. And the classic one of that, in, in my mind, was the Battle of Gravelot Saint Privat when um, he gen when at the end of it, and unfortunately situated down at the bottom end at, at Gravelot, yeah, he walked away from the decisions. And at the end of the day, thought they'd lost. And it wasn't until much later uh, that he learned that actually they'd won through the um, uh, what had actually been a great delegation to the Saxon corps and the, other, uh, the others to go and uh, uh, do the enemy over at, uh, at saint Privat. So uh, my question is, uh, do you think that um, military historians think are guilty of thinking backwards into Moltke uh, uh, as opposed to actually looking at the realities of what actually happened. Thank you. I mean, it's it's a, it's a good and interesting question, and I and I think all historians, um, you know, sometimes face this issue of of we know the outcome, therefore, you know, we can work back through these things. Uh, and and I think you're you're right. I think that 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 Moltke himself would have uh, understood these battles as he was setting the conditions, and and a lot of the interpretation of Moltke's actions after the war are around this. And Moltke and the the definition of of strategy or operations as it as it came later to be known was about that movement off the battlefield. Um, and it was about putting the right forces in the right place at the right time. Um, and that that uh, that would create the conditions for success. Um, and that those that it would be your tactical commanders who would have to carry through that success. Um, I mean, Moltke, I think is very open about this. Um, you know, he, he talks about strategy as a system of expedience um, and, you know, no plan survives contact with the enemy. All of these, these types of things are, are I, I think, his way of, of, of trying to get after that, that uncertainty that, that, that comes about in, in, in conflict and in, in war. Um, I, I think the challenge really comes later. Um, and, it, and it comes when the Germans are trying to do much more complex things. I mean, ultimately, uh, kind of great um, uh, Sedan, Metz, they're, they're fairly simple affairs. Um, you know, you're, you're talking about a, a few armies, um, you know, with, with uh, hundreds of thousands of men. You know, once you get to 1914, we're on the Western Front, you've got two and a half million men in seven different armies uh, carrying out at least three different lines of operation. Um, that's when I think it becomes a lot more challenging to, to continue with that, that kind of approach of, of a, of a hands-off um, you know, system of expedience. So that's what I was trying to get after with the, with the, the, the point I was making about command and, and, and Moltke. Oh. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Thank you very much indeed. Um, okay. Uh, we've got uh, several more questions, uh, uh, and one from uh, from Jim Dingerman, uh, Dale Addison, and Frank Hoffman. If I could take them um, in uh, the following order, uh, Dale, Dale Addison, you you put a question there which sort of spans both the uh, Franco-Prussian uh, and the, and the Boer War. Would you would you like to put that to uh, to Rob Johnson? Yes, I would. Um, can you hear me? I can. Yes. Okay. Well, the, the question is that you refers to the use of franc terror and irregular forces, which seem to have caused um, considerable damage to um, the, the, the invading Prussian forces, and um, the fact that the, the, the Prussians went all out to eradicate these units as quickly as possible. Um, you were talking earlier about the influence of the of, of, on British military theory, and I just wondered if it was considered a uh, possibility that uh, by not studying the dangers of Frank Terror and these irregular forces during the, the Franco-Prussian War, does that go in some part to explain um, some of the British losses during the First Boer War, which um, really came down, in many parts, came down to good use of camouflage and concealment, um, good organisation, and above all, accurate rifle shooting uh, within, within the bounds of a particular geographic area. That's, um, that's a great uh, question and observation. I mean, the um, interesting thing for me is that um, British Army had plenty of experience of dealing with uh, irregular forces um, in its uh, various colonial campaigns in Africa and Asia, particularly uh, if you take an example of Africa. Um, you know, the, uh, for example, the Khoza, um, actually, I think there's a sort of glottal stop in that name somewhere um, in Southern Africa, had um, conducted you know, very effective um, guerrilla operations against the British um, in the period even preceding the one you were talking about, in the, in the first Anglo-Boer uh, War. Um, 
there were um, interesting observations made uh, by most um, officers who found themselves in colonial campaigns, but they generally the consensus was that offensive operations were the preference. Uh, and it was all sort of encapsulated at the end of the century, uh, famously by Charles Edward Caldwell, um, who advocated that offensive operations, you know, being on the attack, uh, would actually make guerrilla warfare uh, less likely because you could inflict such a blow um, that they wouldn't, um, they wouldn't get up again. They wouldn't want to continue resistance. And if you couldn't do that because they were so elusive, he said, then you must seize what they prize most. Uh, and effectively that meant either their resources or it could be some icon uh, or it could be a central kraal that they, you know, they, they gathered around and their governance system depended on. Um, so that's where largely that came from. Um, you know, the, I think there was just general agreement uh, in many European armies that actually, you know, guerrilla warfare was a real problem, a real thorn, uh, as Clausewitz put it, you know, a thorn in the side of a regular army. Um, and that decisive operations were constructed for the very reason of, of trying to prevent uh, that, that kind of thing happening. I hope that answers your question. Yes, that, that's just fine. Thank you. Great. Thank, thanks, Rob. Could um, we perhaps um, go now to uh, Frank, Frank Hoffman, you've, uh, uh, your question, I think, would be uh, uh, directed uh, to both, and, and it actually relates to the Russo-Japanese War, uh, and uh, obviously uh, uh, against the background of the, uh, uh, the Franco-Prussian. Uh, Frank, would you like to ask your question? Sure, and uh, say hello to both Roberts, who are both dear friends. I enjoyed their presentations. I think their papers are fantastic. And they're very much related to work I have going on right now for the Pentagon, trying to study, you know, learning from institutions, uh, both, you know, uh, of which uh, our, our distinguished guests are experts at. But I'm, I'm particularly interested in what they think the Americans, the British, and the Japanese, you know, learn from the Franco-Prussian War. I'm, I'm in studying the Japanese right now in the Reformation period. And it just seems to be a lot of references to German advisors, German concepts, German canon, decisive battle, all the things that Bob uh, Foley talked about seem to be present. I, I just wonder if they uh, have any observations on what others learned from this war, not just the French and the Germans or the British. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think you're spot on. I mean, uh, sort of Jakob Meckel, who, who wrote the book A Midsummer Night's, or sorry, A Summer Night's Dream um, about sort of uh, the tactical developments of the uh, of the, the, the war and, and many others. I mean, he was a prolific German military author in the interwar period and veteran of the, of the Franco-German War, uh, was the lead advisor to the German delegation reforming the, uh, the, uh, the Japanese army. Um, so, uh, you know, th this is, this is where that that influence kind of comes in. So the Japanese, in particular, are, are, are taking that. They're translating German um, uh, German uh, doctrine, uh, sending uh, students to uh, the Kriegs Academy in in um, uh, you know in Berlin. Uh, and, and this is a sorry. Say again. And and so th this is a this is a kind of mechanism for for how you know this these these ideas are are are, are transferred. Um, the Germans are pretty are pretty bullish about sending out um, uh, delegations. So South America as well. Um, there's a big one in in, in Chile, for example. Um, the uh, Ottoman Empire. Um, there's another kind of you know obviously big German delegation in the Ottoman Empire. Um, you know so they're 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 moving these these kind of ideas ideas kind of through the through the the, the different um, services in, or so sort of the different different countries in that way and of course we see after the German victory a a, a great kind of um, almost superficial kind of taking on of, of Prussian um, uh, a, a, a Prussian military and, and German military kind of thing so uniforms change even in the British army uh, you know you, you get a kind of great kind of prussification of, of you know of the ceremonial um, as an attempt to kind of Take on these these things, and uh, and a lot of this work is, you know, that was produced during this period that I mentioned from Jay Luvas is translated into American, um, is translated into into or sorry into English I should say, and and you know and, and so it, it is you know this is a, a mechanism for for how these ideas are kind of spreading um, or, or around the around the world, um, of course 
and this isn't the place to go into it, but the, the Germans learn a huge amount um, from the rest of Japanese um, with a lot of confirmation bias built into it that, you know, they, they're, they're taking away the lessons that they want about sort of things like uh, flank attack um, and encirclement and, uh, uh, and the fact that offensive action still works. Um, and uh, they've made the right idea of investing in howitzers um, uh, rather than, rather than uh, uh, kind of cannons, you know, all, all of these different kind of functions as well. I'm, um, I'm delighted that the pickle halber has already got a mention. Um, you know, <laughs> it was being adopted in 1878, I think, if I'm from Barnes's book, uh, published in 1950, about British military uniforms. Um, yeah, the, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, Frank, the sort of general takeaway point about this is that um, if you have longer periods where there aren't very many major wars going on, and then one comes along and there's an army that's successful, it's probably not that surprising that everyone kind of latches onto it and thinks, what was the formula? You know, in the way that, for example, the 1967 war, uh, the you know, Arab Israeli war, became the sort of cause celebre for, for armies and navies and air forces to say, how did they, how did they do that? How do we replicate that? So we know that that's very influential. I think some of the points that have been made um, over the years by a number of military historians um, has been, you know, the extent to which though armies uh, copy and adopt, or whether they really adapt to their own uses, uh, what it is they're observing. So of course, a lot of armies, like Japanese army adopt a uniform, which is not similar from a, a Prussian uniform. Um, you know, so do the South Americans. Um, if you look at all the South American armies by the 1870s and 1880s, they're all wearing Germanic uh, uniforms. The fact is that they're not um, organized like a German army and they don't have the same system of general staff and so on and so on. And I think, you know, you could do this with the, whether the British are emulated, the Royal Navy uniform, becomes regarded as the standard uniform that sailors should be wearing by the end of the 19th century. Um, but again, a lot of navies seem to uh, try to look like uh, the Royal Navy as the world's largest navy, but are perhaps not um, you know, adapting themselves, and don't have the same systems of operation uh, or indeed the same ethos about you know, how sea captains should operate uh, against their adversaries. So I think there's a very interesting um, observation has been made about why, you know, what people latch onto when they're hungry for success they will look to the kind of the emulation of the model um, that then gets seemingly diffused um, around the world. And I think that's what we're seeing probably in this particular case. Yeah, and filtered through their own culture. I, yeah. was, I, was, I was kind of interested in Rob Foley's issue, the, the tension between the army and Navy ministries and the ministries and the field forces seem to be very similar. So the, the, the structure you know, to the emperor's decisions that seems to be very similar to the Kaiser's as well. And, and of course, the Japanese Navy has got a Royal Navy, British Royal Navy delegation um, to help kind of reform it. So they're, they're, they're trying to pick the, the best from the, from the, the, the West um, uh, and the Royal Navy and the German Army. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Thank you uh, both. We've, uh, we've still got time. Uh, so uh, I think we'll be able to get through um, all of our uh, questions with a bit of luck. Uh, Paul, Paul Schultz. Um, you, you have a question on analytical uh, commentaries on 1870-71. Would you like to ask your question? Yes. Is my microphone working? Yes, it is. Well, it, it's simply that we are judging justly harshly the, the failure of the professional militaries to draw enlightened conclusions from 1870 to 71. Was the intellectual material available that they could have used that they could have fastened upon or, or uh, did they even uh, um, talk to each other or, or, or our staff talks uh, a 20th century um, uh, innovation I, i'm just wondering how much this was a general failure of um, uh, global perceptiveness about the lessons of, of that campaign or whether it was just the sort of entrenched restricted circle of staff officers that we're blaming was the world thinking about this in useful ways? And did anyone notice? I, I'm not sure I'd say the world was thinking about it, but 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 armed forces were. Um, and uh, I, I think that there is an enormous amount of, of evidence um, that, that 
that uh, that they could have gone into, and and indeed I, I alluded to it in my my my, my paper, uh, the kind of second half of the Franco-German um, War, and this is kind of looms over a lot of what we've been discussing today, um, mm -hmm. is is something that 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 got kind of swept very quickly under the rug. Um, for the most part, you know. So if you look at the official histories, and if you look at the you look at the the products of say the the, the German general staff, it's it's about the official view, you know. So it's about the decisiveness of battle. It's about um, uh, about kind of rapid campaigns. It's it's all these things that that I I, I kind of try to try to touch on. Um, and there are some people who are writing about the second second phase within the German German military uh, and 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 elsewhere. And, and indeed, some of the other panelists might want to sort of comment on on these things, but. Uh, but the the you know people like um, uh, Komer van der Goltz, um wrote a great biography of, of uh, Leon Gambetta um, and looked at the raising of the of the, the, the these armies uh, and indeed his work kind of a people in arms is a, is a kind of um, cry for help of saying look you know what we what we really need to do is 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 uh, expand our army. Uh, he also wrote quite a lot about the second phase of the war as did a few uh, as did a few others. Um, there's a uh, Fritz Hernig is another kind of prominent um, German author of this, this period who wrote, I think it's a seven volume sort of set that looks at kind of the second phase of the war. There are others who looked at the kind of partisan kind of element too. Uh, Georg Cardinal von Wittern is a, is a good example of it, another kind of multi-volume set. And, uh, but these tended to be the, the uh, exception rather than the rule. Um, so once you start looking at, the, at the, the, the official literature, it's all about the official kind of view of, of, of what brought about success and what success was. Uh, and this is my point in a sense of what it means is that crowds out this discussion of, well, what happens when you, when these battles aren't decisive? You know, what happens when you don't win, you know, in, in, initially? And, you know, what happens when you're facing that, that, that kind of, um, that, that, those, those people in, in arms? Uh, that evidence is there and it's there from the colonial campaigns, I think, as, as, as Rob has kind of pointed out as well. Um, but it didn't fit, I think, you know, into a, 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 a broader kind of, a, a, approach that, that they were um, uh, wanting to do. And I think there's an element of desperation in it, you know, by the end, you know, that, that, that they recognize that war has become big, become complex, and might not be that, that short, decisive war that they, that they want, but um, that they haven't given it enough real thought, I think, to, to be able to, to answer that question effectively. Uh, I'm grateful that, that Rob has kicked off the answer to that. Um, but with the chair's sort of, um, you know, forbearance, um, uh, Hugh Strawn also uh, raised a, a very similar question about, you know, uh, professionalism and um, quite rightly reminded, you know, the, and it's in the paper, Hugh, to reassure you uh, about Morris, Henderson, Wilkinson and others. Um, the question that, that I guess, you know, to answer that, well, I'll answer it uh, with a question, which is what does a war tell you? Um, and the problem is that, you're never quite sure whether the war you've just observed is exceptional, um, which is, of course, how they felt about the South African War of 1989-1902, or whether it's a general trend that you should observe. Uh, and we've seen this just in the last few months uh, or last year with the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, you know, using drone technology. People saying, is that how war will now be conducted? And I think, you know, um, just picking up on a few people, um, uh, you know, um, uh, Morris is one of the figures in Britain who takes a professional interest in what the war has actually taught. Um, and Sir Garnet Wolsey, who obviously becomes Commander-in-Chief, uh, was very pleased uh, that Morris had quoted um, Wolsey's work uh, on the potential of entrenchments in warfare, uh, which was a direct result of seeing the, the sheer numbers of casualties caused in some of these battles uh, on the Franco-German border. Um, then there's uh, GFR Henderson, of course, um, who observed um, that uh, the unfortunate effect of Wolsey's skill at improvising logistics in campaigns in Africa uh, was that staff work remained relatively poor. In other words, the, the unfortunate effect of Wolsey's success story as a kind of campaign was that, you know, um, you've got a retardation of the British Army's ability to do proper staff work and certainly not following uh, the Prussian model, perhaps. Um, Hugh quite rightly refers to Spencer Wilkinson as another sort of deep thinker about, you know, what's going on with this studies of German thinking in Britain, bringing that to a wider audience through his newspaper articles initially, and then ultimately then at Oxford. Um, and one of the things that, you know, observations for me that's very striking about Wilkinson's work 
was his observations about what is a people's war. Um, people's war, of course, as Rob was pointing out earlier on today, is not necessarily about you know guerrilla warfare, you know, people's in that sense, but actually rather more nation in arms. And you know, I think what Wilkinson was often driving at was you know what is uh, a nation in arms? What does a war look like? Uh, in, in this era, uh, when you've got that sort of going on. And of course, there's the French, you know, um, we shouldn't neglect that. The Ecole de Guerre produced, um, you know, British were making observations about that, were thinking carefully about what the French were saying, but drawing very different conclusions. It was very much contested. People didn't agree on those um, French uh, discussions. And the debate goes on uh, through this period. I mean, uh, entrenchments and field fortifications are one area, uh, the relative importance of offensive or defensive operations or offensive or defensive strategy, um, military strategy, I mean by that, uh, the relative importance of machine guns and artillery and how they should be used either forward or in the rear. Um, and then we've got the kind of the classic one, which has been much debated uh, over the years about the use of cavalry. Was it to be, as the British had discovered uh, for themselves in the late 1870s, a purely a force that got to a battle zone, dismounted and fought as dragoons, which is what they'd learned from Afghanistan in the 1870s and the 1880s. Was it actually the lesson of general friendship clip drift in 1900, that actually mounted forces armed with sabres could move at such speed they could even outrun, uh, you know, poor shooting by Afrikaner marks and, and defeat them? So which lesson do you want? Uh, they're separated by you know, almost 30 years. Uh, and the more, the more recent one was that cavalry and offensive shock action was going to be much more effective. So what I can say is that when you look through the, the articles in Rusi, uh, the Indian equivalent of Rusi, of course, as well, the Indian United Service Institute, they are hotly debated, um, vehement disagreement about what uh, is going to work in the future. And in particular, I think the one we can draw this back to a European context is Jean Bloch's work um, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. British officers didn't think Bloch had got it right at all. They didn't think that armies would reach stalemate in the boom mass entrenchments. The entrenchments would be temporary affairs around which there would be offensive action which would produce the sort of victories the Japanese have produced in the Frank, uh, in the um, Russo-Japanese War uh, of 1904-5. So, you know, the question for all of us is, what do our historical ancestors learn from each war? What do they think is exceptional? And you know, I, I guess we yourself should reflect on what is it, what are the lessons been of even more recently? Thank you. Great, thank you very much, um, uh, Rob, for that. Uh, just a few more questions as we go. We've got one from uh, Gigi, not further identified, uh, very short, which is, uh, um, were there any military, British military observers present on either or both sides in the uh, Franco-Prussian War? Well, I was going to defer to Rob, but um, one of the interesting things was that uh, there were uh, British observers and newspaper people on the uh, accompanied the German forces, particularly Prussians, uh, because they were given permission to do so. I think that's right, Rob, isn't it? Um, and on the French side, there was great distrust of um, there being military observers, and I think there were rather fewer. I'm, I'm not sure, because I'm not a specialist on the French military, um, I'll defer to Rob uh, to, to come in here and, and tell me whether there were um, observers on the French side. I don't. I don't know of any, and and someone like Arnell might 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 know, uh, or Mel might know know this as well. But but uh, I I think you know you've got two issues, don't you? That that the imperial army um, is over relatively relatively short order, um, and uh, and and I think it becomes a harder thing to do in in um, uh, you know uh, the scratch forces that that um, that kind of take its place. Um, so they're definitely there. Um, you know, there, there are definitely British observers there for the for the on the German side, American observers. You know, there, there, there's quite a coterie, the Schachten, Schlachten Bummler, uh, that that kind of you know that 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 uh, accompany the headquarters into into the field, including Phil Sheridan, who was who was mentioned uh, mentioned earlier uh, today as well. Good. Thank you very much, Armel. If you're there, uh, uh, would you like to uh, offer a comment? You don't have to. Uh, Robert Middleton was a British uh, journalist who covered the conflict. Uh, he was on the French side, and uh, right. there was as well some Russian observers, and one uh, was on the French side and was very critical uh, regarding the uh, lack of organization of the French armies. Okay, thank you very much. That's great. If I'm on duty, can I just say in Kitchener? Served as a volunteer in the first in on the French side, 
as a private soldier. Wow. Mm. Thank you. So, Konstantinos, are, are you still there? If you are, would you like to put your question? Hello. Hello. Hi, uh, thank you very much for that. That's been an amazing uh, day so far. Uh, very interesting stuff. So my question is, uh, we talked about the civil military relations models in the German army and in the German state and how the wars were directed. I wanted to ask, to what extent was this uh, working model of CMRs adopted by the Ottomans? Because they trained a number of Ottoman officers as well as uh, uh, Ottoman academies adopting uh, German systems for military education. Uh, it, it's a good question, and I, I have to say I, I don't I don't know enough to say authoritarian authoritatively. Um, my my suspicion is that from the German military perspective, they weren't particularly interested in the civil military relations question. Um, and so they wouldn't have really offered much in the way of advice. Um, whether the uh, Ottomans um, uh, used the kind of German model, which was a fairly common model. I, I'm not, you know, the, the Germans weren't alone in, in having a, a, a monarch as, a, as, a, uh, as the kind of uh, head of government and, and military, um, you know, and, and, and using this. Um, you, you know, they, 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 they may have picked that up. I, 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 don't, I don't know uh, is, the, is the short answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> I might be able to help actually a little bit. Um, I spent a lot more time trying to figure out how the Ottoman army uh, actually works as opposed to the way that it's often presented that it works. Um, uh, certainly, civil relations, Rob is right. Uh, it, it's not an easy um, thing at all. Um, even the jurisdiction of the sultans by the time you get to the early 20th century is are, are much disputed. Um, and there's a great um, a deal of uh, uncertainty about how they should go about things. But from a purely um, military education, in terms of what do they uh, do in terms of learning and training, uh, there are some very smart um, military academies established uh, in the Ottoman Empire in the late 19th century. Um, and there was a real commitment to make um, the improvements that were required by uh, emulating as best they could uh, within the confines of the resources they had, which were pretty limited, um, you know, to, to make the improvements they needed to uh, modernise their army. So there's a change of armament, there's a change of military syllabus, there are new drill books, um, in the ways that other armies were trying to do uh, in that period. The academies themselves are pretty good, um, and indeed there were um, Ottoman officers that went on uh, to um, you know, attend uh, German institutions but a little bit later in sort of significant numbers. The real change, though, of course, doesn't happen until um, really the 1910s, and then there's kind of a, quite a, a rapid acceleration of what you might call the Germanization uh, of the Ottoman forces, uh, with all the consequences that, that followed from that, of belief in offensive action which failed them so badly, Suez in 1915 and uh, Salakamish in December 1915. Great, thank you very much Rob, that's hugely enlightening. I, I think we have one more uh, uh, question uh, from an anonymous attendee and it's uh, put tactically was the war fought like the Napoleonic Wars or like the latter stages of the American Civil War which was often seen as a precursor to the trench warfare um, uh, of World War One. Oh, School of Security Studies would like to answer this question live. Oh I'm slightly confused by that. So we haven't got it. So if either uh, either of the rocks would like to uh, to address that, fine, and we'll we'll work something out. Sorry, I got kicked off. Um, so I was. Uh, I what, what's the question? Oh, I see. Yeah. Sorry, um, it's an, an anonymous attendee has, has put. You know, tactically, was the war fought like the Napoleonic Wars, or more like the latter stages of the American Civil War, uh, which is often seen as a precursor to the trench warfare of uh, the First World War. 
uh, I, I'll go because I think I'm unmuted. Uh, I, I think it's it's a good question. Uh, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I, I I think that that uh, uh, there is a, a a real attempt to kind of recreate some of the the kind of ideas of the Napoleonic Wars, and and of course you know uh, uh, given the technologies at the time and and the force structures at the time, you know we I think we can we can see that to a certain extent. But cavalry doesn't you know doesn't feature terribly prominently. I, I think this is very much an you know, artillery war, much like mm -hmm. the much like the the American Civil War, um, mm -hmm. and much like the the First World War uh, would be as as, as well. Um, and I think that the that the Germans and the Prussians in particular had recognized this from 1866. Uh, they put a lot of a lot of energy into into you know, uh, reforming their artillery uh, in the intervening years, and indeed the French had put a lot of, you know, uh, a, lot, a lot of, uh, um, you, you know, energies into this too. So I, I think artillery is emerging here very much as it was in the, in the, uh, uh, in the American Civil War and would come even more so in the, in the, uh, uh, in, 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 in the First World War. Um, uh, you know, you see some field for fortifications, um, you know, as well. It, it's nowhere near as, as kind of, uh, as, as much as you got in the American, American Civil War. Um, uh, and, and I think strategically too, I think that, that that there's a there's a difference, you know, I think as we heard earlier today, um, you know, Moltke aside wanting to to crush the, you know, the French once and for all, and Bismarck's desire to punish the, you know, the 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 the, the French. The reality is I don't I don't think, you know, you, you're not you're not getting the the kind of um, you know, march on Georgia, you know, type of type of affair you get in the American American Civil War. So I don't I don't think it's quite as it's quite as vicious um, you know, as you get, although I'm happy to be corrected on that. Great. Thank you very much. Rob Johnson, do you want to say um, anything? Well, only very briefly. I mean, Rob's covered it, but uh, you know, um, it, it's very hard to make these kind of judgments because there's a whole, you know, almost mm. a decade in between mm. the two conflicts. Um, but you know, the, there are some similarities. You know, you can find tactically um, in the fighting of 1864 uh, around Cold Harbour with what you see a gravel of Saint Privat, uh, for example, uh, use of terrain, field craft, where cavalry gets itself in trouble. But there's some pretty significant differences. I mean, the, the siege uh, around Petersburg. Um, it is radically different from the 18th stages of the Franco-German War, but probably a little bit more like the Siege of Paris um, in its more mature phase. Um, you know, cavalry gets itself so in the dreadful trouble, um, unlike, you know, Phil Sheridan's sort of famous episode um, that leads to the Appomattox kind of moment, where, you know, um, cavalry are seen as a sort of decisive arm uh, there. I mean, I, I think pretty much what we were realising was the cavalry was no longer the decisive shock arm that it had been in the Napoleonic era. Um, and I think, you know, as Michael was saying at the very beginning of the day today, you know, that this is genuinely a period of transition. Um, and there are some things that still apply, like offensive action um, that apply to the Napoleonic period, the American Civil War, uh, you know, and uh, this particular conflict. There's stuff that's rapidly disappearing. And, um, you know, the descriptions of mitrailleurs' fire, when it's effective against formed bodies of men, you know, is an indicator, perhaps, that, you know, any sort of close order formation is gone. It's all loose order skirmishing, um, which is a, a lesson, as you know, the Americans uh, themselves have learned the battlefields uh, of late 1863, early 64, you know, that you don't form up shoulder to shoulder and you go to ground as soon as you come under fire and you start digging. Great, thank you very much. I'm just going to have a last look at uh, whether we've got a, a final uh, question to address. I don't think we have, I think, uh, We've uh, we've gone through the the, the whole list and uh, in very impressive manner. So um, before I, I wrap up, give an opportunity to 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 both the presenters. Do you want to make any final comment? Uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, I, 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 you know, I, I've, I've enjoyed the kind of papers a lot today, and and uh, I, I've gotten an enormous amount out of the, out of uh, listening to kind of everything today. Um, and I think is with all of these things, you know, the, the the real benefit is is not your own work, but 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 really kind of you know hearing what other people are doing. So thank you to everybody and and no, to your organisers as well. No, great. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. Rob. Oh, here, here. I totally agree with that. And, um, you know, the, um, you know, I think what's hopefully striking about this panel in particular is about how you think about war and mm -hmm. how you think about particular wars and what one learns from it. 
and you know that's been very much the theme I think we picked up today. And I, I do hope that you know the spirit is Michael Howes looking down on us now approvingly, but that's exactly the sort of thing that I, I know fascinated him. Great, thank you very much. Well, just by way of conclusion, I think I said earlier that uh, we had an enlightening session in Prospect, uh, uh, and uh, I trust you'll all agree when I say uh, I, I wasn't wrong. Um, indeed, I think we've enjoyed a highly stimulating pair of presentations and Q and A um, exchange, which I think has they've illuminated sharply the significance of the Franco-Prussian War, and equally the expertise um, and deep understanding um, of our presenters and uh, so altogether first class uh, and a bouquet to each of you but on behalf of the organizers and uh, and sponsors of the conference um, the French Embassy in London where Colonel Dr Armel Duroux as we know has played a pivotal role um, Armel um, uh, a very good friend um, uh, is an exemplary soldier scholar and a strategic uh, thinker and hence his, the, the great impetus he's put behind uh, this event, and also to KCL, notably Mark, uh, and all uh, attendees. Um, I'd like to extend hearty thanks to uh, both Robs for their splendid contributions. And on a personal note, um, it's been rather more than a pleasure and a privilege to have had the opportunity to act as chair of this session. I think that's it from me, and I hand back over to Michael. Thanks very much. Yes, a, a great panel um, and, and a great day. And, and thanks, David, for sharing. Um, so uh, we've got uh, virtual drinks uh, coming up at, at six o'clock. Um, so I, I guess that gives us about 20 minutes to uh, raid. If, if we've got a wine cellar raid, bows or, or fridges or drinks cabinets, we'll go to the, the corner shop. Um, so we'll be um, dropping out in a minute uh, and then we'll have to reconnect at six. Um, just an announcement for tomorrow morning, of course, we've got um, uh, uh, more events or a, an event planned, um, but we've made a, a small change. Um, I think erroneously we put in opening remarks for 11 o'clock, um, which doesn't really very, make very much sense at this stage. So. Um, you've got an extra kind of half hour lie in if you like um, we'll be starting at 11 30 tomorrow and we'll be launching straight into uh the round table um i would make, make a plea to the round uh, uh, the actual direct participants uh, of the round table that's Hugh Strawn and Karine Varley and Julia Nichols Jasper Heinsen and Marika Koenig to um, log in about 15 minutes before that, so 11.15, just to make sure um, that the, the sort of technical aspects uh, are, are going to work. But um, yeah, that's, that's me done for the time being. So again, thanks very much and see you in about 20 or so minutes. <laughs>